heads of his Spinoza by Charles Bradlaugh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite Spinoza by Charles Bradlaugh Baruch Spinoza, or Espinoza, better known under the name of Benedict Spinoza, as rendered by himself in the Latin language, was born at Amsterdam in Holland on the 24th of November, 1632. There is some uncertainty as to this date, as there are several dates fixed by different authors, both for his birth and death but we have adopted the biography by Dr. C. H. Bruder in the preface to his edition of Spinoza's works. His parents were Jews of the middle or perhaps somewhat humbler class. His father was originally a Spanish merchant who, to escape persecution, had emigrated to Holland. Although the life of our great philosopher is one full of interesting incidents and deserves to be treated fully, we have but room to give a very brief sketch referring our readers who wish to learn more of Spinoza's life to Lewis's Biographical History of Philosophy, Westminster Review, number 77, and Encyclopedia Britannica, page 144. His doctrines we will let speak for themselves in his own words, trusting thereby to give the reader an opportunity of knowing who and what Spinoza really was. One man shrinks with horror from him as an atheist, Voltaire says that he was an atheist and taught atheism. Another calls him a God-intoxicated man. We present him a mighty thinker, a mastermind, a noble, fearless utterer of free and noble thoughts, a hard-working, honest, independent man, as one who two centuries ago gave forth to the world a series of thinkings which have crushed, with resistless force, the theological shell in the center of which the priests hide the kernel, truth. Spinoza appears in his boyhood to have been an apt scholar, and to have rapidly mastered the task set him by his teachers. Full of rabbinical lore, he won the admiration of the rabbi Moses Mortira. But the pupil rose higher than his master, and attempted to solve problems which the learned rabbis were content to reverence as mysteries not capable of solution. First they remonstrated, then threatened. Still Spinoza persevered in his studies, and in making known the results to those around him. He was threatened with excommunication, and withdrew himself from the synagogue. One more effort was made by the rabbis who offered Spinoza a pension of about a hundred pounds a year if he would attend the synagogue more frequently and consent to be silent with regard to his philosophical thinkings. This offer he indignantly refused. Reason failing, threats providing futile, and gold being treated with scorn, one was found sufficiently fanatic to try a further experiment, which resulted in an attempt on Spinoza's life. The knife, however, luckily missed its aim, and our hero escaped. At last, in the year 1660, Spinoza, being then twenty-eight years of age, was solemnly excommunicated from the synagogue. His friends and relations shut their doors against him. An outcast from the home of his youth, he gained a humble livelihood by polishing glasses for microscopes, telescopes, etc., at which he was very expert. While thus acquiring by his own handiwork the means of subsistence, he was studying hard, devoting every possible hour to philosophical research. Spinoza became master of the Dutch, Hebrew, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin languages, the latter of which he acquired in the house of one Francis van de Ende, who from it is more than probable he received as much instruction in atheism as in Latin. Spinoza only appears to have once fallen in love, and this was with van de Ende's daughter, who was herself a good linguist, and who gave Spinoza instruction in Latin. She, however, although willing to be his instructress and companion in a philological path, declined to accept his love, and thus Spinoza was left to philosophy alone. After his excommunication he retired to Rheinsburg, near the city of Leiden in Holland, and there studied the works of Descartes. Three years afterwards he published an abridgment of the Meditations of the Great Father of Philosophy, which created a profound sensation. 
In an appendix to this abridgment were contained the germs of those thinkings in which the pupil outdid the master, and the student progressed beyond the philosopher. In the month of June, 1664, Spinoza removed to Werburgh, a small village near the Hague, where he was visited by persons from different parts, attracted by his fame as a philosopher, and at last, after many solicitations, he came to the Hague and resided there altogether. In 1670 he published his Tractus Theologico-Politicus. This raised him a host of opponents. Many writers rushed eager for the fray to tilt with the poor Dutch Jew. His book was officially condemned and forbidden, and a host of refutations were circulated against it. In spite of the condemnation, it has outlived the refutations. Spinoza died on the 21st or 22nd of February, 1677, in his forty-fifth year, and was buried on the 25th of February at The Hague. He was frugal in his habits, subsisting independently on the earnings of his own hands. Honorable in all things, he refused to accept the chair of professor of philosophy offered to him by the elector, and this because he did not wish to be circumscribed in his thinking, or in the freedom of utterance of his thoughts. He also refused a pension offered to him by Louis the Fourteenth, saying that he had no intention of dedicating anything to that monarch. The following is a list of Spinoza's works. Principiorum Philosophis Renati Descartes, Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, Ethica, Tractatus Politicus, Diamandation Intellectus, Epistole, Grammaticus Hebraque, etc. There are also several spurious works ascribed to Spinoza. The Tractatus Politicus has been translated into English by William McCall, who seems fully to appreciate the greatness of the philosopher, although he will not admit the usefulness of Spinoza's logic. McCall does not see the utility of that very logic which compelled him to admit Spinoza's truth. We are not aware of any other translation of Spinoza's works except that of a small portion of his Ethica by Lewis. This work, which was originally published in 1677, commenced with eight definitions, which together with the following axioms and propositions were reprinted from the Westminster Review in the Library of Reason. Definitions 1. By cause of itself, I understand that the essence of which involves existence, or that the nature of which can only be considered as existent. 2. A thing finite is that which can be limited, terminari potest, by another thing of the same nature. Ergo, body is said to be finite because it can always be conceived as larger. So thought is limited by other thoughts. But body does not limit thought, nor thought limit body. 3. By substance I understand that which is in itself, and is conceived per se that is, the conception of which does not require the conception of anything else as antecedent to it. 4. By attribute I understand that which the mind perceives as constituting the very essence of substance. 5. By modes I understand the accidents, affections of substance, or that which is in something else, through which also it is conceived. 6. By God I understand the being absolutely infinite, that is, the substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses an infinite and eternal essence. Explication. I say absolutely infinite, but not in suo-genre, for to whatever is infinite, but not in suo-genre, we can deny infinite attributes. But that which is absolutely infinite, to its essence, pertains everything which implies essence, and involves no negation. 7. That thing is said to be free which exists by the sole necessity of its nature, and by itself alone is determined to action. But that is necessary, or rather constrained, which owes its existence to another, and acts according to certain and determinate causes. 8. By eternity I understand existence itself in as far as it is conceived necessarily to follow from the sole definition of an eternal thing. Axioms 1. Everything which is, 
is in itself, or in some other thing. 2. That which cannot be conceived through another, per aliud, must be conceived per se. 3. From a given determinate cause the effect necessarily follows, and vice versa. If no determinate cause be given, no effect can follow. 4. The knowledge of an effect depends on the knowledge of the cause, and includes it. 5. Things that have nothing in common with each other cannot be understood by means of each other. That is, the conception of one does not involve the conception of the other. 6. A true idea must agree with its original in nature. 7. Whatever can be clearly conceived as non-existent does not, in its essence, involve existence. Propositions 1. Substance is prior in nature to its accidents. Demonstration, per definitions 3 and 5. 2. Two substances having different attributes have nothing in common with each other. Dem. This follows from definition 3, for each substance must be conceived in itself and through itself. In other words, the conception of one does not involve the conception of the other. 3. Of things which have nothing in common, one cannot be the cause of the other. Dem. If they have nothing in common, then, per axiom 5, they cannot be conceived by means of each other. Ergo, per axiom 4. One cannot be the cause of the other. Q.E.D. 4. Two or more distinct things are distinguished among themselves, either through the diversity of their attributes or through that of their modes. Dem. Everything which is in itself or in some other thing, per axiom 1, that is, per definitions 3 and 5, there is nothing out of ourselves, extra intellectum, outside the intellect, but substance and its modes. There is nothing out of ourselves whereby things can be distinguished amongst one another except substances, or, which is the same thing as per definition four, their attributes and modes. 5. It is impossible that there should be two or more substances of the same nature, or of the same attributes. Dem. If there are many different substances, they must be distinguished by the diversity of their attributes or of their modes, per proposition four. If only by the diversity of their attributes, it is thereby conceded that there is nevertheless only one substance of the same attribute. But if their diversity of modes, then substance being prior in order of time to its modes, it must be considered independent of them. That is, per definitions three and six, cannot be conceived as distinguished from another. That is, per proposition four. There cannot be many substances, but only one substance. Q.E.D. 6. One substance cannot be created by another substance. Dem. There cannot be two substances with the same attributes, per Proposition 5, that is, per Proposition 2, that have anything in common with each other, and therefore, per Proposition 3, one cannot be the cause of the other. Corollary 1. Hence it follows that substance cannot be created by anything else, for there is nothing in nature except substance and its modes, per axiom 1 and definitions 3 and 5. Now this substance not being produced by another is self-caused. Corollary 2. This proposition is more easily to be demonstrated by the absurdity of its contradiction. For if substance can be produced by anything else, the conception of it would depend on the conception of the cause, per axiom 4, and hence, per definition 3, it would not be substance. 7. It pertains to the nature of substance to exist. Dem. Substance cannot be produced by anything else, per Corolli, proposition 6, and is therefore the cause of itself that is, per definition one, its essence necessarily involves existence, or it pertains to the nature of substance to exist. Q.E.D. 8. All substance is necessarily infinite. Dem. There exists but one substance of the same attribute, and it must either exist as infinite or finite, but not finite, for, per definition two, as the finite it must be limited by another substance of the same nature, 
and in that case there would be two substances of the same attributes, which, per Proposition 5, is absurd. Substance, therefore, is infinite. Q.E.D. Scholium 1. I do not doubt but that to all who judge confusedly of things, and are not wont to inquire into first causes, it will be difficult to admit the demonstration of Proposition 7 because they do not sufficiently distinguish between the modifications of substances and substances themselves, and are ignorant of the manner in which things are produced. Hence it follows that the commencement which they see natural things have, they attribute to substances. For he who knows not the true cause of things confounds all things, and feigns that trees talk like men, that men are formed from stones as well as from seeds, and that all forms can be changed into all other forms. So also those who confound the divine nature with the human naturally attribute human affections to God, especially as they are ignorant of how these affections are produced in the mind. If men attended to the nature of substance, they would not in the least doubt Proposition 7. Nay, this proposition would be an axiom to all, and would be numbered among common notions. For by substance they would understand that which exists in itself, and is concerned through itself, i.e., the knowledge of which does not require the knowledge of anything as antecedent to it. But by modification they would understand that which is in another thing the conception of which is formed by the conception of the thing in which it is, or to which it belongs. We can have, therefore, correct ideas of non-existent modifications, because, although out of the understanding they have no reality, yet their essence is so comprehended in that of another, that they can be conceived through this other. The truth of substance, out of the understanding, lies nowhere but in itself, because it is conceived per se. If, therefore, any one says he has a clear idea of substance, and yet doubt whether such substance exist, this would be as much as to say that he has a true idea, and nevertheless doubts whether it be not false, as a little attention sufficiently manifests. Or if any man affirms substance to be created, he at the same time affirms that a true idea has become false than which nothing can be more absurd. Hence it is necessarily confessed that the existence of substance, as well as its essence, is an eternal truth. And hence we must conclude that there is only one substance possessing the same attribute which requires here a fuller development. I note, therefore, 1. That the correct definition of a thing includes and expresses nothing but the nature of the thing defined, from which follows Two, that no definition includes or expresses a distinct number of individuals, because it expresses nothing but the nature of the thing defined. Ergo, the definition of a triangle expresses no more than the nature of a triangle, and not any fixed number of triangles. 3. There must necessarily be a distinct cause for the existence of every existing thing. 4. This cause, by reason of which anything exists, must either be contained in the nature and definition of the existing thing, viz. that it pertains to its nature to exist, or else must be beyond it, must be something different from it. As therefore it pertains to the nature of substance to exist, so must its definition include a necessary existence, and consequently from its sole definition we must conclude its existence. But, as from its definition, as already shown in Notes 2 and 3, it is not possible to conclude the existence of many substances. Ergo, it necessarily follows that only one substance of the same nature can exist. It will be necessary for the reader to remember that Spinoza commenced his philosophical studies at the same point with Descartes. Both recognized existence as the primal fact, self-evident and indisputable. But while Descartes had in some manner fashioned a quality, God and God-created substance, Spinoza only found one substance, the definition of which included existence. By his fourth proposition, of things which have nothing in common one cannot be the cause of the other, 
he destroyed the creation theory, because by that theory God is assumed to be a spirit having nothing in common with matter, yet acting on matter. And Lewis speaks of the fourth proposition in the following terms. This fallacy has been one of the most influential corruptors of philosophical speculation. For many years it was undisputed, and most metaphysicians still adhere to it. The assertion is that only like can act upon like. But although it is true that like produces causes like, it is also true that like produces unlike. Thus fire produces pain when applied to our bodies, explosion when applied to gunpowder, charcoal when applied to wood. All these effects are unlike the cause. We cannot help thinking that, in this instance, the usually thoughtful Lewis has either confused substance with its modes, or for the sake of producing a temporary effect, has descended to mere sophism. Spinoza's proposition is that substances, having nothing in common, cannot act on one another. Lewis deals with several modes of the same substance as though they were different substances. Way, more to make his argument the more plausible. He entirely ignores in it that noumenon of which he speaks as underlying all phenomena, and uses each phenomenon as a separate existence. In each of the instances mentioned, however varied may be the modification, the essence is the same. They are merely examples of one portion of the whole acting upon another portion, and there is that in each mode which is common to the whole, and by means of which the action takes place. Much has been said of Spinoza's God and divine substance, and we must refer the reader to definition six, in which God is defined as being infinite substance. Now, although we should be content to strike the word God out of our own tablet of philosophical nomenclature as being a much misused, misrepresented, and entirely useless word, yet we must be very careful, when we find another man using the word, to get his precise definition and not to use any other ourselves while in his company. Spinoza, when asked, What name do you attach to infinite substance? says God. If he had said any other word, we could not have quarreled with him so long as he defined the word and adhered strictly to the terms of his definition, although we might regret that he had not either coined a word for himself or used one less maltreated by the mass. Spinoza said, I can only take cognizance of one substance, of which I am part, having infinite attributes of extension and thought. I take cognizance of substance by its modes, and in my consciousness of existence. Everything is a mode of the attribute of extension, every thought, wish, or feeling a mode of the attribute of thought. I call this substance, with infinite attributes, God. Spinoza, like all other thinkers, found himself overpowered by the illimitable vastness of the infinite when attempting to grasp it by his mental powers. But unlike other men, he did not endeavor to relieve himself by separating himself from that infinite, but knowing he was part of the whole, not divisible from the remainder. He was content to aim at perfecting his knowledge of existence, rather than at dogmatizing upon an indefinable word which, if it represented anything, professed to represent an incomprehensible existence far beyond his reach. We ought not to wonder that in many parts of Spinoza's writings we find the word God treated in a less coherent manner than would be possible under the definition given in his ethics, and for these reasons. Spinoza, from his cradle upwards, had been surrounded with books and traditions sanctified by the past, and impressed on his willing mind by his family, his tutors, and the heads of his church. A mind like his gathered all that was given, even more quickly than it was offered, still craving for more, more light, more light. And at last light came bursting on the young thinker like a lightning flash at dark midnight revealing his mind in chains, which had been cast round him in his nursery, his school, his college, his synagogue. By a mighty effort he burst these chains and walked forth a free man, despite the entreaties of his family, the reasonings of the rabbis, the knife of the fanatic, the curse of the church, and the edict of the state. But should it be a matter of surprise to us that some of the links of those broken chains should still hang on the young philosopher? 
and seeming to be a part of himself, almost imperceptibly inclined to old ways of thinking and old modes of utterance of those thoughts. Wonder not that a few links bang about him, but rather that he ever succeeded in breaking those chains at all. Spinoza, after his secession from his synagogue, became logically an atheist. Education and early impressions enlarged this into a less clearly defined pantheism, but the logic comes to us naked, disrobed of all by which it might have been surrounded in Spinoza's mind. If that logic be correct, then all the theologies of the world are false. We have presented it to the reader to judge for himself. Many men have written against it. Of these some have misunderstood, some have misrepresented, some have failed, and few have left us a proof that they have endeavored to deal with Spinoza on his own ground. McCall says, In the glorious throng of heroic names there are few nobler than Spinoza's. Apart altogether from the estimate we may form of his philosophy, there is something unspeakably interesting in the life and the character of the man. In his metaphysical system there are two things exceedingly distinct. There is, first, the immense and prodigious but terrible mathematical skeleton which his subtle intellect binds up and throws as calmly into space as we drop a pebble into the water and whose bones, striking against the wreck of all that is sacred in belief or bold in speculation, rattle a wild response to our wildest fantasies, and drive us almost to think in despair that thinking is madness. And there is, secondly, the divinest vision of the infinite, and the divinest incense which the intuition of the infinite ever yet poured forth at the altar of creation. The Treatise on Politics is not Spinoza's greatest work. It is in all respects inferior to the ethics and to the theologico-political treaties. But there are in politics certain eternal principles, and it is for setting forth and elucidating these that the treatise of Spinoza is so valuable. In the second chapter of that treatise, after defining what he means by nature, etc., he, on the sixth section, proceeds as follows. But many believe that the ignorant disturb more than follow the order of nature, and conceive of men in nature as a state within the state. For they assert that the human mind has not been produced by any natural causes, but created immediately by God, and thereby rendering so independent of other things as to have absolute power of determining itself, and of using reason aright. But experience teaches us more than enough that it is no more in our power to have a sound mind than a sound body. Since, moreover, everything, as far as it is able, strives to conserve its being, we cannot doubt that if it were equally in our power to live according to the precepts of reason, as to be led by blind desire, all would seek the guidance of reason and live wisely, which is not the case. For every one is the slave of the particular pleasure to which he is most attached. Nor do theologians remove the difficulty when they assert that this inability is a vice or a sin of human nature, which derives its origin from the fall of the first parent. For if it was in the power of the first man to stand rather than to fall, and if he was sound in faculty and had perfect control over his own mind, how did it happen that he, the wise and prudent, fell. But they say he was deceived and tempted by the devil. But who was it that led astray and tempted the devil himself? Who, I ask, rendered this the most excellent of intelligent creatures so mad that he wished to be greater than God? Could he render himself thus mad, he who had a sane mind and strove as much as in him lay to conserve his being? How, moreover, could it happen that the first man, in possession of his entire mental faculties, and master of his will, should be both open to temptation, and suffer himself to be robbed of his mind? For if he had the power of using his reason aright, he could not be deceived, for as far as in him lay, he necessarily sought to conserve his own being and the sanity of his mind. But it is supposed he had this in his power. Therefore he necessarily conserved his sane mind, neither could he be deceived. 
which is evidently false from his history, and consequently it must be granted that it was not in the power of the first person to use reason aright, but that he, like us, was subject to passions. Spinoza is scarcely likely to become a great favorite with the Woman's Rights Convention. In his ninth chapter of the same treatise he says, if by nature women were equal to men, and excelled as much as they in strength of mind and in talent, truly amongst nations so many and so different, some would be found where both sexes ruled equally, and others where the men were ruled by the women, and so educated as to be inferior to them in talent. But as this has never happened, we are justified in assuming that women, by nature, have not an equal right with men but that they are necessarily obedient to men, and thus it can never happen that both sexes can equally rule, and still less that men be ruled by women. Lewis, in his seventh chapter on modern philosophy, thus sums up Spinoza's teachings and their result. He says, The doctrine of Spinoza was of great importance, if for nothing more than having brought about the first crisis in modern philosophy. His doctrine was so clearly stated and so rigorously deduced from admitted premises that he brought philosophy into this dilemma. Either my premises are correct, and we must admit that every clear and distinct idea is absolutely true, true not only subjectively, but objectively. If so, my objection is true, or my premises are false. The voice of consciousness is not the voice of truth. And if so, then is my system false? But all philosophy is impossible. Since the only ground of certitude, our consciousness, is pronounced unstable, our only means of knowing the truth is pronounced fallacious. Spinozism or skepticism, choose between them, for you have no other choice. Mankind refused, however, to make a choice. If the principles which Descartes had established could have no other result than Spinozism, it was worth while inquiring whether those principles might not themselves be modified. The ground of discussion was shifted. Psychology took the place of ontology. It was Descartes' theory of knowledge which led to Spinozism. That theory must, therefore, be examined. That theory becomes the great subject of discussion. Before deciding upon the merits of any system which embraced the great questions of creation, the deity, immortality, etc., Men saw that it was necessary to decide upon the competency of the human mind to solve such problems. All knowledge must be obtained either through experience or independent of experience. Knowledge dependent on experience must necessarily be merely knowledge of phenomena. All are agreed that experience can only be experience of ourselves as modified by objects. All are agreed that to know things per se, nomina, we must know them through some other channel than experience. Have we or have we not that other channel? This is the problem. Thus, before we can dogmatize upon onto logical subjects, we must settle this question. Can we transcend the sphere of our consciousness and know things, per se? I. End of Spinoza by Charles Bradlaugh